So um, let's move on to some newer concepts. Um, and one of those is acid base, which is going to be recurring uh, throughout this course. So it's very important to get a good qualitative, uh, not really calculation based, but just qualitative understanding of acid base. Um, so let me remind you uh, that an acid, right, or acidic proton acts like H plus, okay, or is electron poor. Okay, it's willing to donate H plus into solution or get rid of positive charge. Uh, basic is the opposite. Basic means the atom of interest is electron rich. Okay, so I always want you to think first, any question about acidity is gonna be some trend that makes the hydrogen really electron poor. That'll be the most acidic. And a question about basicity, they're looking for the most electron rich atom. So lowest pKa, right, or most acidic, uh, means we need to go through each of these compounds and uh, designate the most acidic proton, okay? So there are hydrogens on carbons in all of these molecules, uh, but generally hydrogen on an electronegative atom like nitrogen or oxygen or on a large atom like sulfur, those are more acidic for trends that we'll discuss. And then we have hydrogen on carbon and we have hydrogens that are on carbon again. So those are the most acidic protons of the molecule and I'm going to deprotonate them and think about their conjugate base. The more stable the resulting conjugate base is, or the happier it is with electron density, then the more willing the acid would have been to become the conjugate base, or it's more willing to donate a proton and become a minus. So this one's nitrogen that's anionic. Oxygen, same thing. Here we have a carbon that's got a lone pair and a negative charge. This time the alkyne retains negative charge on carbon. And then we have sulfur, negative charge. So I'm gonna add some space here. You might want to grab additional room and so I can draw out a, a brief cross section of the periodic table and talk about trends of acidity, right? Remember there's two ideas. Um, first of all, as we're looking across the second row, uh, boron, carbon, right, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. These are second row atoms where as we go towards fluorine, we increase electronegativity and that increases acidity. So for all of these horizontal uh, comparisons, you can assume they're pretty much the same size, not quite, but in this course, the size difference is small. And the trend that matters is electronegativity. So if we're comparing atoms that are all in this second row, right, where this now basic atom, O versus N versus C versus C, four of those, or sorry, three of those atoms are in the second row that comp, um, comprises four of those conjugate bases. So we know how to compare those. Uh, but if we look also at sulfur, right, let me draw out some more of the periodic table here. Sulfur is larger. And especially as you go down to things like bromine and iodine, right? As we go down the periodic table now, is we're increasing size or the atomic radius goes up, acidity also goes up, which goes against the electronegativity trend. Okay, so you have these two competing trends. So for vertical comparisons, size wins. It's pretty much experimentally proven for most atoms. Uh, for horizontal comparisons, then there's no size difference and electronegativity wins for acidity, okay? So uh, if you're comparing diagonally, then there's no rule that I'm gonna write for that because it's not a, a cut and dry issue. And hopefully you, they will avoid problems unless you have PKAs that you're given where there are uh, 
diagonal comparisons like sulfur versus nitrogen. Um, that's a harder comparison or, you know, sulfur versus fluorine as well. Um, so what that means is uh, sulfur is going to be more acidic with a proton than oxygen because of size. But then that should be more acidic than the others, nitrogen and carbon in that example, because of electronegativity. So if you go back above um, and, and look at these atoms, it's not just an electronegativity comparison for a couple of them, right? We have nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, and carbon. So the two carbons must be distinguished somehow. And this one's sp2, where it has a lone pair, and it's one away from a pi bond. So that's a resonance stabilized carbanion. And then this one is sp. And remember that sp is more electronegative. So this is another trend within electronegativity. Electronegativity increases with increasing percentage of S character. Or if you're comparing a carbon that's SP, it will be more electronegative and more acidic with a proton than a carbon that's SP2. And that will be more electronegative and more acidic than a carbon that's SP3. So, Electronegativity is only a fair periodic trend. You can only read this trend here from carbon increasing to nitrogen, right? Electronegativity is only a fair comparison if they're all the same hybridization. Because if you change the hybridization and the S character, then things get screwed up. So I'm going to give you a list or a trend here to memorize so that you don't have to worry about any of those hybridization issues from now on. Um, so this is electronegativity of those second row atoms when we're just comparing atoms of the same size. And recall that fluorine is pretty much always more electronegative than oxygen, which is typically going to be carbon and nitrogen. But what happens next is strange. So when nitrogen is sp3 and carbon is sp, that 50% S character carbon is actually more electronegative than sp3 nitrogen. This is where the periodic trend breaks down because of the S character. After that, it's predictable and the sp2 carbon and sp3 are the least electronegative there. Okay. Um, so I'm going to give you some associated pKa's if each of these atoms has an acidic proton and I want you to commit these to memory because we'll see these types of acids over and over in orgo one and two. So I'm just drawing out some example functional groups of alkene, alkane, and associated pKa will be written below. And the nice thing about this trend here um, is that they increase by about 10 pKa units from left to right. HF's pKa is 3.2. If you just know it's 5-ish, that's fine. And alcohol is between 15 and 20. That's the same as water. Uh, alkynes are about 25 because of that highly electronegative sp carbon. Next is uh, an amine, which is about 35 sp3 nitrogen. And then an alkene is 45 and an alkane is 55. Okay. So as you go down in electronegativity, you go up in pKa. So now we can see from above, right, that the most acidic here should be sulfur because of size. It beats oxygen. That's a vertical comparison. And then oxygen is the most electronegative of those second row atoms. And then the sp carbon beats the sp3 nitrogen because of hybridization. I gave you that trend below. And then finally, 
the sp2 carbon is the least electronegative and this resonance does help out but it's not as acidic as the amine okay so those are important values to know and please remember that hybridization affects electronegativity so it's sort of a subcategory of electronegativity when you're doing rankings of acids and bases all right, let me kind of speed through some more of these so we can move on to some newer stuff with resonance. Some more acid base here. Now we're comparing pairs of bases and there's some distinguishing feature between them. Uh, the stronger base, remember the bases uh, need to be electron rich. And, uh, oh, there's a question. The order here is um, lowest pKa, sulfur, second one's alcohol. Uh, Third one's alkyne, number four is the amine, and then number five is the sp2 carbon. Um, so if you look at these first two bases, nitrogen with an amide ion, or it's negatively charged, versus nitrogen with one lone pair, it's a neutral amine. Okay, I think it's pretty clear that the more electron-rich one is the negatively charged one. The unstable negative charge, right, or four lone electrons on nitrogen are really repelling each other and would like to have a proton to stabilize some of that negative charge. So that one will readily accept H plus. Uh, now comparing these two, they both have the same charge. They have the same atom, oxygen. They have the same carbonyl functional group. The only difference is a nearby electronegative atom or pair of atoms in this case. And when you're looking at atoms nearby, not the actual basic atom of interest, but something that's pulling electrons or donating electrons, you want to think about the inductive effect. Now, inductive means through sigma bonds. And fluorines are naturally very electronegative, right? So they're going to take electrons away from this first carbon, which is then going to pull electrons away from the next carbon, and so on. And so that fluoro pair is going to spread out or help to distribute this region of electron density over a greater space. So this is not just inductive effect, but specifically when it's an electronegative atom like fluorine, it's called inductive withdrawal or it's withdrawing, it's a sigma electron withdrawing group. And that's going to help with the excess of electrons by spreading them out, or it stabilizes the conjugate base via charge dispersion. Which means stable, right, is synonymous with weak as the weaker conjugate base. The negative charge is okay. It's not that unstable because it's being pulled around. So it does not need a proton to counterbalance it. The compound that needs a proton is that which doesn't have the induction. Okay, that's a stronger base. The CH bonds that are now here in place of the fluoros, CH bonds are the opposite. They are sigma electron donating groups or they are nearby inductive partners that donate electron density. I want you to remember that for CH bonds and CC bonds. Neither atom is electronegative and therefore they're generous with electron density. And that donation is going to make this charge worse, right? It's already too electron rich. And we sure as hell don't want to donate more electron density towards it. So that one needs a proton to stabilize the negative charge that's too electron rich, or it's a stronger base. All right, remember the more unstable is always the more reactive or the stronger of the pair. Uh, this final example here uh, has two oxygens, the so same atom, which means same electronegativity and same charge. Um, the difference is looking at 
oxygen when it's one away from a benzene ring as opposed to oxygen one away from a cyclohexane ring, right? Notice this carbon here has a hydrogen or it has four domains and is sp3. And this oxygen has four domains and is truly sp3, which means all of that negative charge is bunched up and localized or it cannot delocalize through resonance. It has nowhere to go. It's very charge dense. It really needs a proton or it's a strong base with unstable localized negative charge that's burdening oxygen. The other compound is quite different. So here, there's a lone pair one away from a pi bond, which means this lone pair is delocalizable. And we're going to talk about resonance extensively in a minute. But let me draw the first resonance structure of many and show you that this compound is really a hybrid, where there are five resonance structures you can draw. And the true molecule does not just have negative charge on oxygen but the negative charge is distributed throughout every other atom. Or we have delocalized electrons, which always stabilizes the compound. The more resonance, the more stabilizing as we spread electrons out. So this is gonna be less electron rich because it's sharing some of that electron density through resonance. And in fact, to share electrons through resonance, this oxygen is actually sp2, as we can see here. And sp2 is more electronegative, right? Um, AKA more acidic, AKA less basic than sp3. That's another reason why this is the weaker base. So the stronger base here is the compound with no resonance that is sp3 hybridized. Okay, weaker means stable. Um, looks like there's a question. How do you know when it cannot resonate? Um, give me 10 minutes and we'll talk about resonance a bunch and then you'll see when we can push electrons around and when we can't. Uh, but the key here is when it was sp3 then it's called isolated or there's no resonance. That's the problem. We'll do resonance examples in just a minute though. Um, all right another acid base problem that we're moving on is uh, the following where you might be given some acid HA where the acidic proton is here on the electronegative oxygen and a base, let's just call this one B minus, where there's an electron rich atom, the oxygen with three lone pairs. And those will react. So here we're drawing the products and we're gonna talk about the equilibrium, right? Remember that Lewis base or electron pair donor is gonna give electrons to that hydrogen, but the hydrogen cannot accept electrons and keep its old bond, we must simultaneously push this pair onto the oxygen. So um, if you consider now deprotonating the acid, that gives A minus, the carboxylate ion, and the alcohol is now neutral. That's gonna be HB, the conjugate acid. And if you have a pKa chart, or if you remember some of the pKa's that I wrote in that list above, um, an important value to know is that a carboxylic acid with this structural group is around five generally. And the pKa of an alcohol is much higher, 15. Okay, so you may or may not have to memorize pKa's. I suggest knowing some of them. Um, they may be giving you a chart on the exam. I'm not sure how they set that up, but if they want you to calculate equilibrium constants, we do that by labeling the pKa 
of the acid on each side. And the equilibrium constant is KEQ or 10 to the difference in pKa's. 10 to the product pKa minus reactant or 10 to the 10, which is 10 billion, right? Or infinite, uh, meaning that this side is 100%. It's product dominated. And there's basically zero reactant. So if you want to amend this equilibrium arrow and show that it's pretty much 100% towards products, there's a tiny reversible arrow. This more stable or weaker side is greater in concentration. The stronger side or less stable will react and be consumed. So the equilibrium always favors the higher pKa, but here it favors it by a factor of 10 billion. And the reasoning for that, of course, is that this negative charge here is resonance stabilized. Or it's one away from pi bond. And like I said, we'll discuss some resonance structures in a minute, but resonance increases acidity in this case. A final example of acid base, right? Given this acidic proton on the electronegative sp carbon of the alkyne, that's HA, and this could be the base B minus. The nitrogen has two lone pairs. The electron rich nitrogen donates or makes a bond with the hydrogen, and then the CH bond must break towards carbon. Okay. So you get an anion on carbon, sp carbanion, and a nitrogen that's now neutral with two isopropyls and one lone pair. And that means Hb here is the conjugate acid and A minus is the conjugate base. Okay. So now if you're going to calculate the equilibrium constant, we need to know pKa's once again for the acids. So HA has a pKa of 25, terminal alkyne, right? So I gave you that example on the previous page. And then HB has a pKa of 35. That was for the sp3 nitrogens. So the equilibrium constant, once again, is 10 to the difference, or 10 to the positive 10. Those happen to have the same equilibrium constant. So there's a tiny arrow in the backwards direction, right? Or the stronger side has the lower pKa and is less stable. And the weaker side has the higher pKa and is more stable. And once again, you'd have 100% product because of how big the equilibrium constant is. Okay, so you need to be able to think about um, the relative acidity of compounds and uh, to classify that quantitatively as well in thinking about pKa differences.